And in a way, he, he really corroborates Jung's idea about the collective unconscious. He constructed whole languages. And I think it goes back to what you were saying, Lisa, of you, you know, you live in those books because they have a psychic reality that something in us recognizes. There is a depth, there is another level or aspect of reality that belongs to the mundus imaginalis. You just did this beautiful job of describing the Red Book and kind of one of the primary insights that comes from it, which is that the inner world has its own reality. And what I'm really struck by is, you know, you've told us your story of uh, finding the Lord of the Rings, and I think we each have our own. And I was, I think, mm-hmm. 11 or 12 when I started reading it. And I still remember where I was sitting when I was reading it. And it was like realer than real. I think there's something about meeting it at that point in your life, too. But I mean, I, I think I spend some part of every day in Middle Earth still all these decades later. Um, it's just a place I kind of go to in fantasy a lot. And, um, and I'm just thinking about, you know, m- maybe... Part of the reason that those books have had such an impact on so many people as it had on you back then, on me, and I think on on Deb and Joseph too, is because it wasn't just it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a novel for Tolkien. It really was an experience, his own kind of experience in this Mundus Imaginalis or in his inner world, like you said, where you there are the the stars and the trees, and there's a kind of infinite to it an infinite quality to it and and of course you know with his um i mean you know as we know he created multiple languages yes you know with their own grammar and vocabulary and scripts and everything so it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't just a i mean not that novels aren't wonderful things but this isn't just a novel this is a real um chronicle of an inner adventure absolutely it, that's a great way of putting it. And both Jung and Tolkien use similar language in that way, that it's a, a record or a chronicle of an experience. And, you know, for both of them, they reworked the primary experiences to give us something. Like the Lord of the Rings isn't just raw from the imagination. He revised it again and again, which I think is necessary to be able to kind of hand the gem over to someone so that we can have the kind of experience that was coming to him maybe more spontaneously. Uh, And it took a lot of kind of gleaning of Tolkien's letters and essays to really get a sense that, oh, right, he's actually intimating that this was an experience. He doesn't come out and say it in the same way that Jung does. You kind of have to dig to find that. But when you do, what he says over and over again was the sense that he wasn't inventing. He was discovering something that was really there. This is the language oh. he used. There were, it was there somewhere. Um, he uses similar language when he describes uh, the languages that he invented, where certain words would just come to him. And wow. again, to find this out, you, it's a little bit couched in some of his fiction uh, that was unpublished during his lifetime, uh, fiction such as The Lost Road and the Notion Club Papers, which anyone who wants to dig into this can find in. Uh, the 12 volume history of Middle Earth. It's all very kind of fascinating. But in those stories, he talks about ghost words coming through and that he, huh. he couldn't, he'd hear the words and they came with set meanings and they couldn't be changed. But then he could build language around them. Now, he's not saying that directly mm-hmm. in, say, a letter or an essay that he's hearing these ghost words, he's putting it in fiction. But if you look at what the words are, those are the exact words with the exact meanings that he's putting in his lexicons all the way back in 1915. So it's not hard. And those are the words that last all the way through. He can't change the meaning. You see them again and again, all the way, you know, his writing up through 1949 when he finished The Lord of the Rings. Um, He refers to things, he refers to something that he calls fairy and dramas or elvish dramas. And some scholars interpret this as he's kind of making something up that seems a little bit silly. But if you really pay attention to what he's saying, 
it sounds like he's describing a visionary experience. And it's, you know, it's really a matter of how seriously do we take what Tolkien is saying about where these stories come from. And if we do take mm-hmm. them seriously, because what's his incentive in just making this up when he's so philosophically committed to working out exactly what's going on? That one can't help at least posit the idea that when he's talking about fairy and dramas, he seems to be describing something that's very comparable to Jung's active imagination experiences. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And in a way, he, he really corroborates uh, Jung's idea about the collective unconscious. Uh, that, that's, you know, these things came to him, uh, he constructed whole languages. And I think it goes back to what you were saying, Lisa. You, you know, you live uh, in those books because yes. they have a psychic reality that something in us recognizes. Uh, and it gives it a special power uh, that there is a depth, there is another level or aspect of reality that belongs to the mundus imaginalis, as Henri Corbin had it. And Jung walked up and down in his garden talking to these imaginal figures and had conversations with them, and they told him things he did not know consciously. Uh, so it, it calls up a lot of, hmm, what really is going on here? And it seems wild to really seriously consider that both Jung and Tolkien and a whole host of others, uh, have a knowledge of these, this other realm, the realm of psyche. And as Jung said over and over, psyche is real as an independent, separate reality. And some of us can access it. And, and your interest in uh, Henri Corbin and his paper on the Mundus Imaginalis seems so apropos. So just a bit for our listeners, that Corbin was very interested in these kind of 12th century Persian mystics and one of the things that struck him, similar to Becca's discovery, is that across time, they seem to be describing the same landscape, mm. which then creates this possibility that there is a knowable, imaginal landscape that many different people and across time can discover and map and find uh, similar anchoring points within these realms. And so standing there with Corbin's, I don't know, certainty, but certainly his inspiration, that there is a place that people go that Jung and Tolkien may very well have found the same world, describing it from slightly different entry points. <laughs> 